Hi, it's Kevin again. In the last video, we presented a project to make a software reader for punched cards, and we looked at the k-means procedure that we plan to use to separate the card from the background in the image. We saw a couple of ways the k-means can go wrong, by asking it for an inappropriate number of clusters, or by having it get trapped in a local optimum. We broke off with the observation that to do better, we need a definition of what makes a clustering good. Let's start examining that now. For one possible approach, let's review the statistical concepts of mean and variance. The mean of a set of numbers or a set of vectors is, of course, just their sum divided by their count. The variance is the mean square distance of each number or vector from the mean. It can be thought of as the square of the standard deviation. One key aspect of variance is that it can be broken down into pieces that are analyzed separately. There's a whole area of statistics devoted to the analysis of variance. In the case of clustering, we can calculate the sum of the squared distances between cluster means weighted by the cluster size to give us variance between the clusters. And we can calculate the sum of the variances within each cluster, again weighted by cluster size, to give us a total variance within the clusters. And the two will add up to the variance of the whole data set. This gives us a score that we can use to compare two divisions into the same number of clusters. Which one is the greatest between classes variance, or equivalently the smallest within classes variance? Which one explains more of the variability of the data, or equivalently, which one has the title clusters? It's easy to compute this score while we're computing the cluster means in the k-means algorithm. Now that we know how to compare whether one clustering is better than another, we have had one brutal way out of being trapped in a local minimum. Simply run the k-means algorithm multiple times with different random starting points and choose the best outcome. Let's run the case it failed before, using a few different starting points, and see how it goes. Eight out of 18 trials seem to have come within a few millionths of the global optimum. That's not too terrible. Data sets with small dimensionality are always the difficult ones, by the way. Spaces of higher dimension somehow have more room to let the points squirm past one another. Now let's look at how we can manage our choice k, the number of clusters that we plan to try for. We could drive the within classes variance as low as we please by going to an arbitrary high number of clusters. There's no within classes variance if each data item is in a cluster by itself. Clearly, that's not the right approach. Instead, we want to drive the variance to the point of diminishing returns and no farther. Fortunately for us, that point is often obvious. We run the procedure that we've developed up to this point for increasing values of k and tabulate the variance that we achieve. Let's go. we plot the achieved values for the within classes variance. Usually the behavior is easiest to see if we use a logarithmic scale for the variance. Very often there will be an abrupt knee in the curve before which adding clusters makes a significant difference to the variance and after which it makes a much smaller difference. This point is clearly where the returns begin to diminish. For these data, the breakover point is at seven clusters. And this matches what the eyeball sees. The data show up as seven groups when they're plotted on the plane. 
K means appears to have colored them correctly. I should probably touch now on a few other things that can go wrong that are harder to fix. The first of these is that the data might have different characteristic length scales. If you do scatter plots of this sort of data, your eye will pick up clusters, but they will be stretched along one axis or another. If you turn k-means loose on data with vastly different scales, you're not going to have a good time. What's happened here is that the huge y distances pretty much force the algorithm to divide across the clusters. In this case, the fix is simple. If we rescale the y-axis to one-fifth its size, then the, all the clusters fall right where the eyeball says they should. It may take some tweaking to arrive at the proper scale factors, or it may require a more complicated transformation of the clusters that are stretched diagonally, or worse, curved. For this reason, I ordinarily recommend looking at some other visualization of the data, such as a series of scatter plots, when the algorithms appear to be going awry. This is place to any machine learning technique, not just k-means. Of course, you have to decide when to pack k-means in and try a different technique. There are a lot of choices available, so don't confine yourself to a single trick. You may particularly want to consider alternatives when clusters are vastly different in size and density. Where your eye can separate clusters in this distribution, k-means simply can't, and struggling to make it go might be a waste of effort. As with anything, no single tool is right for the job. Now we're ready to get back to segmenting the punched card. Recall that the objective is simply to distinguish cardboard from green screen. I won't be trying to do any OCR or handwriting recognition for the stuff written on the card. I simply want to read the holes. The first thing that I did was simply to try k-means clustering on the unprocessed r, g, and b values. I figured that I might need to go through three or four clusters because there were three or four fundamentally different things here. The cardboard, the green screen, the black ink, and the blue ballpoint writing. Certainly two clusters were not enough since segmenting the card on that basis makes all the print look like holes. I could probably work with that segmentation, but it would be dodgy, particularly in the circled area. Going to more classes doesn't really help. It starts splitting the green background into two classes, while continuing to group the ink with the background. I suspected that the problem was one of the ones we've been discussing, so I did some scatter plots of randomly selected pixels from the image. The clusters representing cardboard and green screen are pretty obvious. The cardboard is the one at upper right in each plot, and the green screen is below and to the left of it. The printing on the card didn't form as clear a cluster. It's a whole range of pixel intensities spread out just above the green on the red-green and blue-green plots and merged with the green on the red-blue one. No wonder k-means couldn't separate it. Since it appeared that all the plots showed the clusters spread out at about 45 degree angles, I decided to plot the grouping of red minus green and blue minus green. The result is two round compact clusters, the sort of thing that k-means handles very well. Conveniently, both the black ink and the cardboard fall on the one nearer the origin, while the green screen is the one at lower left. The pixels corresponding to blue ink are the outliers in the upper left quadrant. Sure enough, when I use the k-means classification on these two axes, nearly all the pixels that make up the card separate neatly from the ones that make up the green background. There's a little bit of speckle and a few ragged edges, but I don't think there's anything that will get in the way of positioning the card and finding the holes. I'm going to go with this segmentation. Next time, I'm going to continue with trying to extract the geometry of the card from the segmented image, so stay tuned for that. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep calculating.